My family likes to go to restaurants when we have a chance, and uh, I like to especially go to new restaurants because I like to, you know, check it out. And I'm intrigued, actually, uh, by the whole process of starting up things, having uh, being an entrepreneur at heart and having been there, obviously, at the beginning of CCV. So whenever we go into uh, restaurants that are starting, we have a little game that we, that we play, or at least I play it, uh, and it's called, How Long Do I Give Them? In other words, it's, it's uh, how long do I give this restaurant before it goes out of business? Is it going to make it? How long is it going to make it? How long do I give them? And, and uh, one example is, you know, I'm in a restaurant, and, and I'm, I, I have an opera. I always, whenever they start, I immediately find the owner and congratulate them because it's an awesome thing that you're starting this and providing employment for people in our area. I go up and I ask them all kinds of questions if I can get time, and uh, I'm thinking then, okay, they got a five-year l- uh, lease on this building, and yeah, it's at this, but he's still working to fund it, but she doesn't have to work, so really then they don't need her salary. All they have to do is they have to make enough to pay the loan. May 2012, they're going out of business. And my family's like, what? What are you talking about? For instance, uh, there was a wonderful, loved it, Chinese restaurant that started over in the Target Center. I remember when the Target Center was a new place. I loved this Chinese restaurant. We were there in the grand opening. 20, 25 people working there. I loved the food, loved the people. Owner came over, talked to them, that sort of thing. We get in the parking lot, I'm like, year and a half. They're done in a year and a half. And they're like, why? I'm like, well, because it's 5,000 square feet get a lease on, a, on a, any, anything that knows anything about Chinese restaurants is their little hole-in-the-wall the hole places. 50% of their income is going to come from a takeout business. So they have maybe 10, maybe 11 uh, uh, places where people see, man, they're just not going to be able to sustain this. Sure enough, unfortunately, a year, half, a year and a half into this restaurant, they were done. Here's the thing. I would say I'm pretty pretty good at that, pretty good at estimating how they're going to do, because I'll go into restaurants, I'm like, this is a winner, absolutely, hands down, this thing's going to be here for 10, 15, 20 years from now, this is a winner, but here's the thing, there are some times where I'll go into a place, and I'm like, oh, absolutely, this, they're, three weeks from now, they're done, you know, and then a year from now, five years from now, 10 years, 15 years into this, and this place is still going and it's thriving, and I got it totally wrong. I absolutely blew it. I missed it. And I think, you know, you can play the how long do I give them game with a lot of different things. You can play the how long do I give them game with music, for instance. You remember, you show this picture, you remember this band? You remember these guys? Uh, No, go back to the other one. Remember these guys? Remember the Baja men? What song? What song do they sing? <laughs> Who let the dog out, all right? We saw these guys when Jump 5 came to town. This was years ago. There's a reason this band is no longer in business. There were 20 people on the stage. They were splitting the royalties from one song among 20 guys. They just couldn't afford it anymore. I remember uh, seeing uh, this actor. You guys know who this is? Help me out. Jonah Hill. Jonah Hill. I, years ago when I saw him in some situation... He was talking and performing. I'm like, that guy's a winner. He's going to be around for a long, long time. He is genuinely funny. And sometimes we'll do this with cars. We'll look at a car like the uh, Hyundai Elantra that comes out, and you have a 10-year warranty. There's a reason automobile makers give 10-year warranties, people, right? And what is that? The car's not going to be around very long, right? There's a reason they're going to give you a 10-year warranty. You can play the how long do I give them game with lots of things, including marriages. How many of you have been to a wedding, and you're not doing it on purpose, but at some point during the ceremony, either in your mind, and you're leaning over the person, you're like, two years. <laughs> now, I've learned uh, that you just can't play the how long do I give them game with marriages. One is, because you can't do that. that would, that's terrible, right? That's terrible. You want to believe the best for people. But mainly because people can have the odds stacked against them. Everything is going wrong in their life. 
nothing is going right. They don't have the resources, the family support. They're, what a, and lo and behold, they make it against all odds. They make it. And so they thrive, and they have something to teach us. We're starting a new series today called Love and Marriage, and we're going through the first chapter of the book of James. And this is going to apply whether you're single, whether you're married, you want to be married at some point. We're going to talk about God's wisdom and how it applies to our marriages. And today our passage is in James chapter 1, verse 2. And if you have your Bible with you or your app open, I want you to read along with me. Here's our passage for today. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now, just a little background on the book of James. The book of James was uh, written by the brother of Jesus, and it contains teachings of James applying Jesus' teaching to basic life situations, Monday through Saturday. It's a book of wisdom. It's a lot like our Gospels because there are units of wisdom all the way through the book. It's only five chapters long. And it reminds us a lot of the Gospels, the length of the story and the length of the wisdom. Um, but most importantly, it reminds us of the Gospels because it touches on a lot of the same themes. Um, so essentially what the book of James is, is it is, it's an example of someone taking the teachings of Jesus and applying it to everyday real life. And what we're going to do today and through the next two weeks as we go through the series is we're going to apply it to marriage. Now to do that, what I want to do is I'm going to go back and read that same passage, and what I want to insert is husbands and wives and marriage. So listen to how this sounds. Consider it pure joy, husbands and wives, Whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith and marriage produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that your marriage may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now, when you read this, what's, what comes to your mind? First thing I notice this is when it talks about um, uh, trials of many kinds and joy and everything. There, there are lots of things that are packed into this, but the central idea that pops out to me in this passage and the reason it relates to our marriages is this statement, let perseverance finish its work. Perseverance is, a, is an interesting word in Greek. It's a combination of two words, hupo meno. Hupo means under, and meno means to remain and probably the best illustrations for those of you who are weightlifters like myself, you know what it's like <laughs> to grab a barbell, right? Hundreds and hundreds of pounds. When we go lifting, you're like, I don't know, deadlifting, let's say 500 pounds. When we do this, 10 or 12 reps at a time, we grab the bar, lift it up, and they put it over their heads. And I'm not going to lift it up because my shirt will pull up and they'll see my gut, and that would be weird. <laughs> I don't want to do that. So I usually bring the weight to, anyway, so a weightlifter, right? has the weight over his head. And what do they do? when they're, You see these Olympians, hundreds of pounds. What are they doing, right? Veins popping in their face, their arms shaking, everything. Just to get that weight up and to hold it, that is hupomeno. That is perseverance. That is remaining for a period of time underneath the weight of a particular trial without dropping it and quitting. That's perseverance. That's hupomeno. Now, the other thing that pops out about this passage is this idea of trials being pure joy. Think about that. When was the last time you were going through a hardship and you're like, this is awesome. Give me more. I love this, right? I can think of lots of things that give me pure joy, but trials of many kind do not make the list. Peanut butter milkshakes. Pure joy. How many of you don't like peanut butter milkshakes? Look at these people. Look at their hands. These are the ugly people in the church. These are, <laughs> peanut butter milkshakes are awesome. Fishing for rainbow trout on a mountain stream. I'm not very good at it, but I love it. It's pure joy. Playing lacrosse with my kids in the backyard. Pure joy. My wife picking out a Victoria's Secrets outfit. <laughs> Definitely pure joy. 
right? <laughs> Finding out my father has kidney cancer, definitely not pure joy. See, when it comes to marriage, you and I know, for those of us who are married or have been married, you know that there are trials of many kinds that come against our marriages. There are money trials, right? Too much money left at the end, of, too much month left at the end of the money. Debt, student loans, credit cards, not enough savings, emergencies that come out. Uh, trying to care for homes and cars and insurance and retirement, all that kind of stuff. Kid trials. You know, lovable kids, when they're young, you take pictures of them. When they're old, they're teaching you patience. This is, that's what happens. That's what you did to your parents. That's what they're doing to you, and that's what they're going to do to their parents. Irritating habits. Those kind of trials or the way she chews her food or the way he snores or one's a germaphobe and the other one's a slob. Sex trials, too much, not enough. It's getting old. Family trials, in-laws, siblings, stepchildren, decisions where to go for holidays and birthdays and feuds and fights and he's not getting along with her and him and household responsibilities. People who don't do the dishwasher right ought to be saved for the darkest pits of hell, right? (laughs) Overall expectations. This is actually probably the hardest. Boredom, dissatisfaction, and disillusionment. These are the trials of many kinds. And if you were to make a short list of your trials of many kinds that you faced in your marriage, undoubtedly you would add lots of things to this list. Retirement transitions, health problems, aging parents, job stress, and on and on and on. When any of these come at your marriage, James says, don't run from them. Let perseverance finish its work. These trials, actually, God is allowing them to come in your life so that your relationship can be mature and complete, not lacking anything. In other words... Whenever you look at someone who has a very immature marriage, they have a situation where the trials that have come towards their marriage, they've avoided them, they've run from them, they haven't gone through them, they haven't grown because of their relationship. So letting perseverance finish its work, the the way I would phrase it, and this is the idea that I want you to remember from this passage, is this. Marriages that work, Practice not quitting over the small stuff. The marriages that work, that grow, that become mature and complete, not lacking anything, are comprised of two people who practice not quitting when the little things come. Now, when I think of quitting, I think when it comes to marriage, the, the, I was trying to think of an example of this. What's, a, what's an example of a marriage that, like, Got, they got married and boom, down for the count quick. And then my immediate thought was these people right here. Kim Kardashian, Chris Humphreys. Chris Humphreys is an NBA star. Kim Kardashian is famous for being famous, right? Now, if we were playing the how long do I give them game, how long would you give these people? Now, if you don't remember what happened, if that particular year you were summering with the Amish, let me remind you. <laughs> On February 7th, 2011, they go public with the romance by posing for photographers at a Prince concert in Manhattan. May 18th, 2011, Kardashian arrives at her Beverly Hills home to find Humphreys in her bedroom on bended knee where he had sprinkled rose petals that spelled out, Will you married me? And he gave her a very small 20 and a half carat engagement ring. This was a marriage made in heaven. This was going places. August 20th, 2011, after just a 90 day engagement, if you remember, they were married at an over atop the affair in Montecito, California. On October 9th and October 10th, Kim's fairy tale wedding, a Kardashian event, airs, and its ratings hit unbelievable numbers, drawing 4.4 million idiots around the world, (laughs) tuning in for this marriage. And then, shocker, October 31st, 2011, after just 72 days of marriage, Kardashian files for divorce, citing irreconcilable differences. 
Well, the swift separation immediately prompted the hitter, the, or the hitter, the Twitter hashtag, things longer than Kim's marriage, <laughs> which I found it interesting. Can you bring up this picture here? Like one was, uh, I'm not kidding, uh, Michael Jordan's baseball career. You guys remember old enough, wow, he's going pro in a double A ball, right? Justin Bieber's chest hair was longer than Kim's marriage, and the iPhone battery was longer than Kim's marriage. Now, here's the thing. James, in his encouragement to people, is not talking about the one big quit divorce kind of a situation that ends it all. He's not talking about that. What he's talking about is not quitting on the small things. He was talking to people around the Mediterranean world who were suffering because of their faith, who were finding it difficult, who found new life in Christ, and all of a sudden, wow, instead of it getting better, it's getting worse. Now, the way that applies to our marriage is this. All divorces, whether it's Kim Kardashian or your experience or the experience of friends that you've had, all divorces is the accumulation of 1,000 smaller quits. That's why this week for our homework, everyone, everyone, not just people who are married, I want us all to read the book of James. Now you're going to notice that the book of James has five chapters. It's not terribly long, and you can read one chapter a day, every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I'm going to encourage you to do that. If you're not married, I want you to read that and ask yourself, how does this apply to my life? What is the truth that Jesus is teaching through James to me that needs to impact my life? But for those of you who are married, who are thinking about getting married, I want you to read this from the perspective of James speaking directly to you as a married couple. When James talks about money and how it's fleeting, I want you to read that as if he's talking to you in your marriage about the, the, the temptation to just do make decisions to do things, to become engrossed in money. When James talks about temptation, I want you to read that as if he's addressing the temptations that come with marriage. When he's talking about anger, I want you to read that as if he is talking about the way you grow impatient with one another in your relationship. When he's talking about the tongue, I want you to read that as if he's talking directly to you about the way that you either build one another up with your tongue or you tear one another down. When he's talking about sickness, I want you to read that as if he's talking about the sickness in your marriage, the bodily, the, the things that you're going through physically. When he's talking about having the kind of faith that is proven by what you do and not just what you say. I want you to think about when people look at your marriage, do they see witness firsthand real Christians who are married to one another or just people that talk about it, people that go to church and then they live however they want. When James talks about being a friend of the world, I want you to think about your marriage. Are you too worldly in your relationships? The, the married couples that you're building friendships with, are you trying to build relationships with them to influence them for Christ or are you emulating them? Are you trying to become like them because you want to be liked or you simply want, to, or you want what they have? When James talks about making plans for the future, we're talking about how we're going to go to this city and then we're going to go to this city. I want you to read and think and apply that to your marriage in the way that you talk about the future. You assuming you're going to be here a month to two years to 20 years from now. The reason I want you to do that is it's great to read marriage books, but it is a fundamentally different thing to want your marriage to improve by reading the book on marriage. Now, why is this? Because marriage grows, marriages grow stronger when you practice not quitting over the small stuff. Your biggest enemy right now in your relationship is not the big massive blow up over money that is going to end everything. People always talk about, what's the number one thing couples fight about? Money. But very few of us think like, uh, wow, this week, wow, it was like the end all discussion where we were just, it was a nuclear holocaust, just blow up over money. 
No, it's the little jabs and what about this and you're spending money on this and not really being on the same page. It's choosing not to have 200 healthy, constructive discussions that eventually lead to the massive financial blow-up that seems to end your marriage. The trials of many kinds James is talking about is the daily stuff that comes in bite-sized small packages where you will say, I will do anything for love, but honestly, I won't do that. We're not going to have that discussion today because I'm too busy. I don't want to talk about that right now. And yes, of course, you can get that knockout blow, but the trials of many kinds usually are very small, very tiny, and I don't even know if this is a word, but very overcomable. And the point is this. When you play the how long do I give them game, the marriages that make it are always the ones that tackle the trials when they are small, when they're immediate, right then and there. And that's because they practice not quitting over the small stuff. Let me give you an example of this. Uh, When our church first started like 14 years ago, uh, I got into a fight with my wife, and like most of our arguments, it was my fault. I'm not going to go on the record for that, but it was. And I chose not to settle the argument before going to bed. And that's bad. Why? What does the Bible say to do with our anger? Don't let the sun, what? Go down on your anger. Why? It's about this very thing that we're talking about. You can deal with it right then and there when it's little, or you can let the sun go down on your anger, and then five years later, you're just angry with one another, and you don't know why. Well, this was Saturday, and I had to preach in the morning, and so I chose not to resolve it, even though she wanted to resolve it. So we went to bed angry, and just to be clear, I was being a jerk. The next morning, we got up in silence, and I shaved and dressed, and again, my wife tried to talk. And I blew her off, and as I was walking out, she asked me a simple question. What are you preaching on today? Then my forehead dropped as I realized oh my gosh, we're talking about marriage today. Which is just a great thing to be dealing with when you're in the middle of an argument like that. So she said, go get him, Pastor. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so we had that. It was one issue. It was one, one little issue. And unfortunately, the next day we did. We dealt with it. But if we hadn't, just like you, when the, when they, the little issue comes up, And we had glossed right over that, and we did it again and again and again and again and again. Eventually, at some point, you're just angry with each other, and you don't even know why. Every massive trial that hits a marriage is always the accumulation of dozens of smaller trials that could have been dealt with when they occurred. And so let me ask you right now, for those of you who are married, what are you glossing over right now? For those of you who aren't married, do you remember the specific moment where you started glossing over stuff? James calls it letting perseverance finish its work. And it is nothing more than saying it's the realization that stuff is coming. It's good. It's healthy that you're going to go through this stuff. The trials of many kinds is what is actually, and the working through that and the communication and the hard work and the, the heartbreak and the pain and all of that, of working through those things, actually turn out to be the things that are going to cause your relationship to be mature and complete. And that's what God wants for you. Consider it pure joy, husbands and wives, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that your marriage may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Let's pray. God, we just humbly come to you and ask you to continue to do the work that you're doing in in our lives. We just pray that we will be open to that, that we would listen and we would respond. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.